Let's <coughs> see now, where to begin, where to begin. I'd like to switch the topics now from uh, what we were doing, which I think we've pretty much scraped as much as we can out of that one example. It would be uh, quite a lot to go further with that. <coughs> a lot of work, that is, on my part. And so I thought that uh, I might uh, go into another topic that may be of considerable interest to a lot of people. And this, um, the reason I haven't put the topic header on the, on the name of this video, kept it a little secret, is because there's a little story, <coughs> I guess there's a little story to go with this. So I'd rather tell the story first than then tell you what the topic's about. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, this story would have an obvious ending. So, now I've mentioned several times, if you haven't been following this, uh, in, the, in the past videos, I've mentioned uh, fairly often this one particular company that I worked for long time ago and um, and the, the reason I keep mentioning that company was because that, that's the only one I really worked for that was a you know proper company in, in the sense of uh, there being a, a big boss and an office and cubicles and all that sort of thing in fact I have a sort of picture of what that company looks like before I left the first time. I'm going to pause the video and try to rearrange my image here. It corresponds with uh, what our office looked like prior to my departure. Okay, now uh, I think this is a pretty good representation of uh, the way things look, sort of. Uh, you know, this is the Classic open office design, uh, not cubicles really. Uh, um, this is during, I guess, during what they called the, the dot com phase of uh, you know, computing, where a whole bunch of people got ridiculously rich, uh, stupidly rich. Um, because they, they knew a couple of things that nobody else knew. And uh, those were, would have been my bosses. And uh, a few people I knew who worked for some of these startups at the time got, got quite rich uh, just being employees. My, actually our bosses, <laughs> our situation was pretty good. There was two boss. There were two bosses really. One was this guy, Neil. I think was his name. Neil. Neil and Henry. And uh, let's see now. One of one or the other of them was a uh, rich to begin with. He grew up with rich parents and. Uh, so he bought this company outright for some millions of dollars. And uh, the other guy was an old friend of his from university days, I guess, who was a lawyer. And he was our other boss. He, he wasn't rich to begin with, uh, but he, he became rich uh, when they finally went public and sold off all their shares and whatnot. But anyway, that, this is before that happened, and uh, the uh, <coughs> office atmosphere was quite nice. And I, I ran in, personally ran into some, let's say, uh, personal difficulties. And so I decided uh, you know, I was going to quit the office life, as nice as it looked and everything. Pretty good salary. But, um, 
I wanted to go traveling and I, I didn't know what was going to happen. So I quit and I just gave my month's notice and left. And uh, I figured that was the end of it. I was never going to go back to work in an office again. Because it was slowly, you know, it was like this, but it was slowly changing into, you know, the movie Office Space, if you ever watched that. It was becoming more and more like that. In fact, it became just like that. And about two years, three years later, I came, I came back to uh, my hometown and figured I had to find a job again. And thinking, no way they would ever hire me again after taking off like that. Without a word. <coughs> but uh, to my surprise, <coughs> the uh, head programmer there, who's an old friend of mine, uh, said, oh, no, no, we, we want you back. Uh, come, come into the office and, uh, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll set you up. We'll, uh, We'll, we'll put, give you a good position and increase your salary and a really nice salary. Um, but the, the, the environment change, I'm going to do another environment change. Okay, so this is what I left it as. And when I came back, it was sort of like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, welcome to the future. <laughs> this was, this is uh, actually some stock foot stock photo I found online somewhere, but uh, it pretty much reflects the uh, the type of mm, environment anyway that that uh, the, the the boss is wanted. You know, for a new company who's getting big and uh, you know I've had important clients like Walmart. And, so on and so forth, and we had to be professional. And, uh, you know, jeans and shorts wasn't allowed you know, in the office, and so it, it was a, a bit more of a, a tense environment. You know, but given what they were offering me, I mean, three times my previous salary. Uh, Less workload. Uh, uh, I, I was to be a, not a, like a minor programmer, but a, you know, I'd have a, I'd be the head of a team and so on and so forth. I so I, I took it, took the job, and it was the the environment was like uh, cubicles, you know, something like. Let's see if we can find it picture of uh, something like office space. I'm just looking at that to find this picture. Like that. Okay. Very much like like the office space look. You get a wide shot. You see, it was a bit more clo closed off, not not an open style, but a um, cubicle style, like this here. This style, uh, maybe not as big, but everyone had their little box, and I had my little box, and it was a little bit more open than this. Maybe. <laughs> I like that scene. No, that's a little bit, a little bit more open than the standard cubicle environment, but not too bad. And I had my cubicle, but um, yeah. <laughs> so you know, it was this sort of environment, uh, but there wasn't that much for me to do, you know. And I was getting a great big salary, and uh. uh there were going to be stock options and everything. Uh, and then I started to get suspicious. I was thinking, here I, I left this company. I walked away without a real explanation. I come back, and suddenly they want to, you know, put me in charge of all these people and uh, give me a easy 
plush dog. And then that by the next week after that, um, the main programmer guy, that old friend of mine, says um, that I'm going to get my own office, like my own personal office, not even in the cubicle area. One of them, a picture of an office. I, I, quite a nice office all to myself. I can smoke and everything. Well, a room. I don't know. Big. Uh, I didn't think I needed my own office. I actually preferred to be in the cubicle. Anyway, it's not important. The, the environment was more like this. And there was another guy. Besides Neil and Henry, there was a new guy. I forget his name. Bolden or something. And, uh, and, and, and nobody ever knew what he really did. <laughs> I had one lawyer, one rich, spoiled Brad. He was just Actually, quite quite a nice guy. He he would talk to us, and then there's this new guy, whatever his name was, and uh, I think he had something to do with. He, he knew people in, in the business world, so he was a good contact. No idea. Anyway, I'm getting suspicious, and one of the things too was there was this new programmer there and uh, I didn't know it at first and he was just sitting in a regular cubicle like everyone else uh, and uh, everyone seemed to be anxious for me to get to know this guy so I talked to him he seemed like a decent fellow you know nothing, nothing particular about him, but eventually I found out that he worked for Microsoft before, uh, and um, so I don't know what he was doing in Montreal. <clears throat> if he'd worked for Microsoft, you know, you think he could be uh, in uh, somewhere warm or something? In, the, in those days, if you worked for Microsoft, you well. The rule was everyone who worked there becomes a millionaire. Almost everyone, I guess, not him. Well, it turns out, it turned out, somebody, a friend of mine working there, it was just like a, it was just like the movies. He let the whole thing, he almost let the whole thing slip. He was talking to me. Uh, he was actually part of my team of four and uh, and he looks at me and he says uh, so um, you know how's work on the bug going I said what work, the work on the one and somebody overheard this and then there was a lot of whispering and hushing and and uh, you know go oh, nothing 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 and so they, they were hiding something from me and the thing they were hiding from me Was the whole reason I got the, I think the whole reason I got the job in the first place back with all the perks and everything was that um, there was this this bug in the code and uh, no nobody could figure out nobody could f find out what it was it was one of these things intermittent random crash intermittent you know and, and uh, it doesn't look good and, and some of the clients were a little bit worried that ra a random thing like that sh shouldn't be happening and what's going on and that was why they hired this Microsoft guy I guess because it turns out that he was sitting there in the cubicles with everyone else and nobody knew that he was making a salary uh, at least twice as much as my boss, who was the lead programmer, and four times my salary. 
So he, he was making close to half a million dollars a year, this guy. And sitting in a little cubicle, you know, unassuming, is sitting there. He turned out to be quite useless, it turned, in fact, in the end. But um, eventually, uh, my, my boss, Blake, owned up and um, they had this bug and uh, and Blake Blake is the, one of those people that you may have met in your life right? someone who another friend of mine would describe as uh, stupidly smart you know like real egghead smart and he he couldn't figure it out but of course he had a lot of responsibilities and on other things and he just didn't have the time, definitely didn't have the time necessary to sit down and work this thing out and try to find out what it was. Uh, and the, the Microsoft guy, I guess he must have thought uh, having connections with Microsoft people might be of some benefit. Maybe they could find out something. Uh, I, I don't know what, why they thought he might be able to fix it, but he wasn't able to do anything. Well, actually, he was able to help me a lot because he he knew something that I I didn't know, uh, and so he was at least able to, to give. The, Give me enough information to, to start going on doing what I, I wanted to do. So, what I had to go on, where I mean, we have these machines installed in stores, and every now and again, a, a random crash. Now, the, the machines themselves produce extensive logs, so you know, you can track to the second, everything that is going on up to the time of the crash. And then there didn't seem to be anything in common with scenarios. It could be at any time you know, uh, during the, the process of doing one order, let's say, uh, just, just suddenly the thing crashes. And so there are little scraps and pieces of information coming in. And the, the bosses, of course, they didn't want to panic anyone. They, you know, we're, we're working on it. We'll bother to fix soon enough. They, you know, didn't want to um, well, at that point we were still working on the automatic uh, upgrading stuff. It still had to be done partially manually. So, if we wanted to update the software in the store, uh, at least we had to get someone on the phone to do a couple couple steps. And so, the last thing that they wanted to do was have <laughs> was yeah, have a great big step, right? And make and make people start panicking. You know, everything should appear as normal. So that was my task. To fix the bug, don't get anybody excited. Um, determine the cause somehow. Um, and uh, and that, that was it. So I knew immediately that the thing that I had to start to look into, since it was a crash, like a you know, Dr. Watson type thing, uh, I had to look into exception handling. So that's going to be the topic next. Uh, exception handling. Oh, sorry, but this picture, I should get rid of it. I'll put it back. Something else. And uh, the thing that the Microsoft guy was useful for was uh, 
um, one of the things one of the, the things that I needed to do was um, a when the crash occurs uh, get the, you know the context of everything information and B somehow try to translate that into symbol names what function was calling what and so on so forth and he was for the second part I didn't I didn't have a clue but he, he knew from his experience at Microsoft uh, about these special libraries I mentioned before that debug help TLL I think was what I used and um, and I'm going to have to reconstruct how I did it because I don't have any of that source anymore. Uh, but uh, first, uh, uh, we'll start off with what exception handling is, what it's about. I have some um, things I put in my favorites here. Uh, now there's a very long article, and I think this is the same one I read uh, by Robert Schmidt, who I'm sure you probably know of. Uh, his inaugural column. Uh, now this guy is uh, super famous. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see now. Uh, no, this is the guy. No, not in 1864. Uh, how about Microsoft? Microsoft or Apple? Bob Schmidt. Gotta be the guy. Senior programmer at Microsoft. Anyway, uh, he he had this great big this article goes on. I was looking at this and I saw part one here and down below. I don't know why it's not showing it anymore. It showed part four. And I thought there must be more more. There must be at least a part two and a part three. And I checked it and I, I found part 16, and so obviously it goes on for a long time. And um, so I, I, I knew nothing, so I started reading uh, an article similar to this, or this one maybe, uh, about um, ex exception handling and, and trying to uh, make sense of. Um, uh, what happens when a, when a crash occurs and try to produce some kind of report and eventually I, went, I did that and uh, and eventually that other Microsoft guy got fired <laughs> uh, because uh, he, he was completely useless he was useful for the one that, uh, telling me about how, how to look up those symbols named and and print them out. But uh, other than that, no use. Now, there's two kinds of exception handling. If, if you're like if you're dumb like me and you have this set to C plus plus, right? Which I probably did at the time. Although it was version uh, six of the compiler, this is version eight, so. It would it, the actual handling would have been different. Uh, exception handling. And there's a great big push about C++ exception handling. Okay. Uh, let me set my time here. 
this is almost about the right amount of time for an introductory thing. Uh, and it keeps uh, discouraging you from looking at anything to do with something called structured exceptions. And uh, let's see now. You are encouraged to use C++ exception handling. Now, that's not the same thing as structured exception handling. Exceptions. Here. Okay, now those are C exceptions. That's a Win32 thing provided by Windows. Uh, all other so in these articles the terms refer to that all of the references to exception handling refer to C plus plus exception handling and that's what you advise to use. Uh, unlike uh, Win32 structured exception handling, the language itself provides support for C plus plus exception handling, and these articles uh, describe it. Uh, for C++ programs, you should use C++ exception handling rather than structured exception handling. While structured handling works in C++ programs, you can ensure that your code is more portable uh, by using C++ exception handling. Uh, it's more flexible, you can handle any type of exception, so on and so forth, whereas C exceptions are unsigned in. <coughs> the only problem is with C++ exceptions is that um, they only occur when you throw them. <laughs> that is, you have to deliberately say, throw something, right? It's not the same as a crash. You don't say, please crash now, right? So you can't use C++ exception handling without some fiddling around to examine a crash. So eventually I figured this out and I realized I was looking at the wrong stuff completely and I looked at structured exception handling, which I'd like to get to uh, in the next few tutorials. and. Uh, and I'd actually like to start with something long before C++. Uh, a completely C thing called, called set jump and long jump, which is a type of go-to. Uh, it's shown in that article, one of the articles, part one, the use of um, Set jump and long jump. I think it's in this part. Yeah. And this is our code had this uh, initially when it was C, pure C. Uh, so the, the, your main would look like this, basically. Uh, and at some point, if there was going to be a, if, if there was some, well, not just main, but other places, if, if there was some situation that you had to get out of, right, and you couldn't use a go-to because you jumping over functions, you use this long jump. I don't know if it's an example of a long jump. But there's another function that goes with a set jump called long jump. And uh, you know that's incorrect. Whereas maybe that say a four 
raise it might be I don't know, I forget the syntax exactly. But it, it amounts to something called long jump, which is a it's like a go-to that that can go through function calls. So it's a long go-to. Normally even in C you you can't go to a label from one function to another. But the set jump call, this call and it has to be done in exactly this way. Um, remembers the current con the context at this point in the program. And if a, if a uh, one of these long long jumps occurs, uh, then you end up this ends up being evaluating to zero. Um, And um, so the context is restored. Right? But there are no, there's no object unwinding to worry about because it's C. There are no classes, there are no destructors or anything like that. I sure like the seal, at least the use of it. Oh, here. No, no, no. That's a long jump. But that's the, the function that you call. Set jump, long jump, and set jump. Two and three. Okay, where's long jump when it's supposed to, when it's working right? Here, raise. Okay, raise exception. Oh, I see. Okay, so here's your program executing. This must return zero always. Ah, okay. Okay. So I guess you you write this down. Set it equal to zero. Then uh, you raise. Ex At some point, you may you may need to raise exception. And here's the code for that. Long jump to one. Don't, don't put zero here because we want this to return false and then here's your exception handling code. See? So that's C exception handling. That should still work. Uh, and that the context is restored, the stack and everything is restored to what it was at this line when the exception is raised. Uh, now, C exception handling is not much different from this. Um, objects don't get unwound. And, uh, you know, the state remains pretty much as it, as it was uh, when the when the, the crash or whatever occurs. That is what you, you would want. Sometimes uh, you know, some People might print out a, a dump, a binary dump of the Im program image at the time of the exception, so you can see everything uh, as it was when the exception occurred. Anyway, so I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on this. I just I'm curious myself, see if it works. <laughs> I remember this call. Never used it ever again. Uh, all right. So the next uh, little uh, mini uh, tutorial set will be on the uh, structure. Well, C plus plus exception exceptions and structured exceptions, uh, which are used for in particular for cat catching. Um, Hardware exceptions, like their processor faults. Okay, there's your intro, and I guess the pro uh, naming, not putting the name 
of the next topic on here is probably kind of useless because the next video will probably have the topic uh, in it. Maybe I can uh, just secretly think of something, something else. Alright, see you.